Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part two for this news bulletin today. All right, we're gonna continue here uh, where we left off with this article, Global Blitzkrieg West uh, Terror Battalions Are Eyeing Russia. And uh, we're talking about how they were taken, uh, how they support Al-Qaeda in Syria openly. And uh, now they're, well, they've always been, but now they're uh, ramping up the Chechen rebels um, that are basically supposedly fighting corruption are actually a western backed uh, terrorist group that uh, is attempting to undermine and overrun the Russian political order. Just like in Syria where foreign terrorists are fallaciously portrayed as indigenous justified pro-democracy freedom fighters, a similar narrative is being spun to whitewashed terrorists operating in the Russian Caucasus Mountains and Reuters recent report Insight, brutality, anger, fuel, jihad in the Russian Caucasus Readers are barraged by outright, outright lies regarding the genesis and under, underlying cause of the violence in the region. Reading like a U.S. State Department press release, we are told that the Chechens are sick of official corruption and want change, like that seen in last year's Egyptian revolution. Reuters fails to acknowledge that last year's revolution has sprung this year's Muslim Brotherhood tyranny, already curbing civil liberties and muzzling criticism in the press at home while supporting... And I covered this um, pretty extensively last week, so you can go in and check it out. But we're talking about this individual, uh, Dako Umarov, and uh, Reuters claims uh, basically they lead, or he leads, an underground movement to create an emirate across the Caucasus region. They fail to mention that he's listed by the United Nations as an associate of Al-Qaeda. Reuters does concede that Chechnya's Muslim faith has been transformed from traditional practices to Saudi perverted teaching spread uh, from madrasas both abroad and now springing up across the Caucasus mountains over the last 20 years. Coincidentally, Saudi Arabia has created as a joint effort with the U.S. Al-Qaeda over the past 30 years. It's, it is young men passing through these madrasas teaching this uh, perverted revision of Islam that keeps the ranks topped off of the West Foreign Legion Al-Qaeda. In reality, the West is opposed to President Putin's return to office. The West is also opposed to providing him with the stability to advance Russia socially, economically, geopolitically outside the Wall Street London consensus. Therefore, it has been determined that foreign armed and directed mercenary militancy, a much more realistic explanation for the sudden surge in violence, will be used to ensure President Putin rules over a destabilized nation instead. The tool of choice has been since the 1980s in Afghanistan are U.S. Saudi funded terrorists indoctrinated with sectarian extremism armed to the teeth and unleashed to spread regression and destruction against all targets of Western foreign policy. So this is what I was talking about before with the, um, as far as Algeria and that goes, it's actually, Libya is now a haven for uh, terrorists and smuggling and stuff like that and uh, destabilizing the area, uh, surrounding areas. Then you have Algeria and all that. And uh, they're all going like a nice little, um, a nice little uh, terrorist organ trail, right? All the way up to, up to Russia. So they titled this little section, Clearing a Path for the Hordes from Libya to the Caucasus Mountains, and uh, how the Arab uh, Spring was basically uh, there to replace uh, the current regimes with pliable Western proxies in Tunisia, Libya, Egypt. So this is kind of interesting. Um, it says here that uh, this one of these factions, Al-Qaeda factions from northern Mali, a uh, Libyan faction, a Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt, and uh, the support from Saudi Arabia, Israel, Qatar, Turkey, and others are all converging on Syria in black, and then Iran. Should Syria or Iran or both fall to Western-backed terrorist brigades, and if the West manages to use uh, Kurds across Turkey and northern Iraq to create a conduit in red, a path will be cleared into Russia's restive Caucasus Mountains and onto Moscow itself. That's a big thing with uh, what's going on with Turkey, um, uh, you know, because they're supporting this whole thing in Syria, uh, and at the same time, they're kind of ticking their own people off, uh, the, the Kurds that are in Turkey and stuff like that, and uh, also the PKK in them. So instead of having to deal with the Kurds like they normally have to, uh, Turkey, they decided to stick their neck out and create buffer zones and supply troops and stuff like that on the border of Syria, create uh, refugee havens along with you know various threats. Uh, what happens if it, it actually creates more instability in Turkey and, um, and in, the, in the long run, 
uh, the Zionists come in and uh, say, oh, you poor oppressed people, you Kurds, let's create your own little state. And then Turkey, who was being used by the West, this is known you know, globally by analysts and that uh, geopolitical analyst, that Turkey is being used like a puppet. I don't think Turkey is ultimately uh, evil like some other countries. I think that they're, um, for whatever reason, they're trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, bridge a gap or whatever they're trying to do. But they're going to be left out to dry in the end. They're going to be used and they're going to be left out to dry. And then they're going to use this, they're going to create their own little Kurdistan. Uh, and uh, it's going to be by the hands of what? The Zionists. They're going to come in and say, oh, you poor Kurds, you oppressed people. And then they're going to come in, they're going to create their own little state, and then they're going to go after Turkey. At least in order to create a little pathway here, enough instability or destabilization. All right, so we covered. We were talking about this last week. Here's more of them, right? Russian police killed two militants in Dagestan. Law enforcement officers killed two suspected militants during a document check in Russia's volatile northern Caucasus region or Republic of Dagestan. Georgia informs NATO about situation in Georgian-Russian border. A meeting of NATO Georgia commission on the situation of the Georgian Russian border was held at NATO headquarters in Brussels. And we'll come back to this uh, map here in a few minutes, but uh, just to give you an idea, you know, I'm sure most of you know this, but uh, sometimes it's good just to uh, step back and take a look at where all these countries actually are. And you'd be like, oh, wow, you know, I didn't know uh, blah, blah, blah was right there. But uh, yeah, so you have here's, uh, here's Iran, here's Iraq, there's our friend Turkey we were just talking about. And we're talking about uh, the Georgia-Russian border, and there's Turkey, and then you have Azerbaijan, which is actually asked uh, by the West, uh, hey, if you want to uh, basically help us fight against Iran, we'll give you a big chunk of territory. Then you have, of course, Afghanistan. That's one of the big reasons why we're there. We're never leaving, because what? It's a, it's a nice base. It's a nice base into Central Asia and into Iran, or Iran, and then you have, of course, Pakistan, where they're already at. Uh, as far as the CIA drone strikes. Head of the Georgian represent, representation in NATO informed the commission about the situation in Dagestan section of Georgian Russian border where law enforcement conducted an operation to neutralize militant groups penetrated from Russia. The sides expressed concern over the situation and called for a solution to all problems on the basis of internationally accepted norms. So it says here that uh, roughly 11 members of the armed group were killed during the operation. The saboteurs refused to surrender. So it sounds familiar, right? Uh, like the story we were just talking about over here in Dagestan, when they uh, police flagged them for a check on the federal highway, the men opened fire instead and were killed by return fire. These guys uh, refused to surrender as well. As a result, the hostage release operation started. Three members of the special forces of Georgia were killed and five were injured in the clashes of Saber. So basically, uh, Georgia Georgia is kind of a, I, I, you know, again, this is kind of globally known, it's kind of a Western uh, uh, supported state. Or country, so it's not. It's not really good for. Uh, it's not really good for Russia. So when you look at the map that we were looking at before, you're going to have Turkey. You're going to have this corridor of all these terrorists coming after Syria falls, uh, and coming through here. And you're going to have Georgia. This is going to be this buffer country where they're going to allow things to go in and go in and go in, right? And import all these terrorists into Russia, but then coming out. They're going to, if, if it has to do anything with, with what Russia has to do to secure the borders, oh, it's going to be, we're being attacked. And then, uh, you know, when uh, sometimes they're going to have blowback where these terrorists that are getting imported are coming out and, you know, and doing what they're doing, uh, they're going to actually shoot some of these Georgians forces and they're going to say, oh, well, what are we going to do? Well, we better send them back to where they came from, right? And maybe they can come back and, uh, you know, uh, uh, terrorize uh, next year. Why is the U.S. fostering ties with Central Asian despots? So this is what we were just talking about uh, in this map right here. The U.S. has been quietly deepening relationships in Central Asia, but in the process it is embracing two authoritarian lifetime presidents who don't have great records on human rights. Well, who fucking cares? They don't care. They support despots in Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest ones in Bahrain, right? But they don't talk about that. They would point, they get your perception, and they point it towards this. This is a humanitarian crisis, so we got to go bomb them to help them. The State Department has repeatedly criticized both uh, for those, those records and for their generally harsh treatments of domestic opponents. Woohoo. Like, yeah, you can get sent to Gitmo, or you can, under Obama, renditions, you get abducted off the street and never seen again. We're not doing anything, right? And tortured. 
So yeah, they're going to support people like this, rewarding dictatorial leaders of Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan for their short-term assistance in uh, the raping, pillaging, and murdering of mostly civilians in Afghanistan. Pretty obvious why they're in, you know, trying to get into Central Asia and get cushy with these uh, dictators and that. They seem to be seeking potential long-term footholds in both countries, which are adjacent to Russia, China, and Iran. The numbers for fiscal year 2013, the Obama regime is seeking for Kazakhstan some $1.5 million for anti-terrorism and non-proliferation programs, $1.8 million to finance military purchases, and $707,000 worth of training for its military in the United States. For Turkmenistan in the same period, uh, same year, the White House is seeking almost 700000 for military purchases, uh, 350000 for that country's military to be trained in the United States. In 2011, it received $1.7 million for anti-terrorism programs. Back in the Cold War days, such leaders in these countries uh, labor, labeled their opposition groups as communists. These days, they call them uh, terrorists or al-Qaeda-linked jihadists. Well, that's funny because they're actually uh, uh, coming out of the West. Like communism came out of the West, imported. U.S. Army Command develops caucus-linked military scenarios from August 21st. Commanding General of the U.S. Army Europe released a report in Foreign Policy magazine that caucuses that historical causeway of conflict between Europe and the Middle East remains a complicated tangle of security concerns. Well, I bet. Ethnic tensions still affect long-standing territorial disputes, internally displaced indigenous people, align with or oppose powerful uh, disporas and an increasing nouveau rich and oil fueled minority upper class is growing in an area once known only for desperate poverty so they're definitely going to go and just give them enough money that upper class and they should be able to get what they want it says the recent georgian experience with russia has left significant cross-border scars that will likely not heal anytime soon especially as georgia desperately seeks nato membership and european acceptance he talks about a crucible or a triangle of three sides with Turkey, Iran, and Russia. The potential for conflict is considered so plausible uh, that they developed scenarios linked to the caucuses to help repair majors for military contingencies a few years ago. So we were just talking about this. The U.S. Army Command's general staff at, uh, here at Fort Leavenworth used the GATT, or Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey exercise as a way to basically prepare for this potential for conflict. From August 24th, U.S.-based deployment in Uzbekistan will dent Russia's influence in Central Asia. Washington plans to deploy its military base in the Uzbek territory could entail negative political and economic consequences for Moscow. They're talking about a possible establishment of a so-called operative or operative reaction center in Uzbekistan, which could accommodate warehouses storing weapons and military hardware following the U.S. forces' withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2014. So they're talking like another terrorist launch pad, right? So they're talking about the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban ideologists will inevitably take advantage of the American presence in Uzbekistan to fuel anti-American sentiment in the local population and win some over their side. As a result, anti-American sentiment will spill over into anti-government demonstrations, i.e. they're going to do the same thing, right? They created the Taliban, they're going to use them so that they can go in there and say, we've got to take out the terrorists, right? And actually, they approved a new bill banning any foreign military bases on this territory, what appears to be an effort to appease regional power Moscow, so they didn't do it. Then uh, Russia wants to build their own military base in Kyrgyzstan, USA, and Uzbekistan. They didn't get it, but this is from 8-23-2012, so this is uh, pretty recent. Russian military in Armenia hold intensive exercises. Servicemen of the Russian military base in, I, I think it's Akazia, are learning how to fire howitzers at targets in the mountains, Interfax report. Also at the Russian military base in Armenia, over 150 communication personnel and about 30 units of hardware are involved in the exercise. I remember this article recently, uh, Iran looks to Armenia to skirt bank sanctions. And to China and Asia, we all know about this, right? The next oil and gas rush is South China Sea. Same company that was trying to get into Somalia, China National Offshore Oil Company, a self-described mega government-owned company, announced the initiative on its website. A move Vietnam said was illegal as the blocks encroached on its territorial waters. But the Chinese army say they're capable of safeguarding maritime rights, adding that any unilateral action taken by Japan cannot change the fact. There's our boy, William Haig, says UK must shed their guilt over being an empire.
post-colonial guilt and be confident about its status on the world stage. He's talking about globalization in the British Empire. He's talking about ex-British colonies across Asia declared independence. He changed the name to Myanmar, but it's still a British colony. Thank you.